So are you the favorite child in your house, in your family? Do you know if you're the favorite child? Are you sometimes the favorite child and sometimes not? Or like me, are you always the favorite child? I'm not always the favorite child, but I know my husband is always the favorite child. He's an only child. And you know how only childs can be. If you don't, I'll let you in on some secrets later when we have coffee together. But what happens when we think that we're the favorite? We have confidence. We have joy. We feel like we're not alone. We feel like we're supported. Maybe we feel like we can do anything. We have this feeling, this freshness that comes over us, and the world cannot take us down when we know that we are loved and we are supported and we are cared for. How does it feel when we're not feeling so favorite? The exact opposite, right? In fact, I think when we don't feel like we're favorite or we don't feel like we're seen or we're heard, it's even a darker, deeper, longer path. That's when we see folks lash out and get angry, cause fights and conflict because they're hurting so much inside. They just want to be seen. They want to matter. We all want to matter. Throughout this story of Jacob, we have seen what competition has caused. And unfortunately, it didn't start with Jacob. Cain and Abel, Sarah and Hagar, Isaac and Ishmael, Esau and Jacob. There is a family system of dysfunction through all of this. Some of us may understand that. Maybe we've come from families with some sort of dysfunction. And Jacob, as I've told you before, we're only learning about 20 years of his 100 plus year life. And he's still in those years where he is still competing to be number one. He has learned to lie and cheat and deceive. And he still, that's the only thing he still knows how to do. Now, if you know where we are in this story, he's run away from home because his mom told him to get going, because his brother Esau was very angry with him. And now he's come to this land with his uncle Laban. He's looking for shelter. He's looking for family. He's looking for food. He's looking for protection. And he comes into this place, and he meets his uncle. Now, in this part of the story... We hear some things that I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to hear. He says that he saw Rachel and she was a vision of beauty. And we can imagine, right, like those soap operas where they used to put the fan on the person coming out and the hair went everywhere in the soft focus and their dress is flowing. And then there's Leah who has weak eyes. I don't know what that means, but we can probably understand. It means she's not the pretty one, right? And so here we are, and Jacob is here, and he sees Rachel. And he love, falls in love with her at first sight, right? I mean, that's normal. He doesn't even have to talk to her or hear her speak, really, or anything. I mean, did he really fall in love with her at first sight? I don't know. But what we do know is that here he has already chosen his favorite. And so his uncle Laban comes up and says, I see you like my daughter. Well, have I got a deal for you? And that also doesn't sit well with our ears today, does it? A deal for you. A deal for you. He says, I will give you the hand of my daughter if you work for seven years for me. Now, I don't know about you, but again, in today's time, that doesn't sound Exactly right. We, we ladies get to choose who we want to marry. But I do remember that my father told me when my husband had finally proposed that my husband had called. Oh, yeah, that's a whole nother story. Um, my husband had called him in California, had called my dad, and he called six times during football season. And the reason I know this is because my mom said she answered the phone and it would be Robert on the phone. And he would say, well, how's the weather out there? And she would say, 
this is how the weather is. And she thought he was such a lovely young man to call and check with her about the weather and what she had cooked for dinner and all the things she liked to talk about. And then my father would come to the phone because he'd ask for my father. And they would talk about whoever won the football game. And then finally, after about six weeks, he worked up the courage and he said to my father, I would like to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage. And my father said, well, I don't own her. She's not mine to give. But I will give you a blessing if you take good care of her and treat her well. Isn't that what all parents want for their children? To be treated well, to be taken care of, to be provided for, to be protected. Later, I asked my dad, I said, Dad, why did you wait till six phone calls to let him get out what he was asking if you already knew what he was going to ask? And my father just said, sometimes a man's got to do what a man's got to do, and it's going to be in his own time. (laughs) So my dad knew, and he waited. That's a little bit better story maybe than we hear with Laban here. But I think Laban does love his daughters. I think he does want to make sure this young, brash man who's run away and done all of these things maybe needs a little time to mature. And so he asks for Rachel's hand in marriage, and he works for that hand for seven years. And we hear in the story the next piece. The wedding happens. There's a big celebration. And the next morning, it's not Rachel. It's Leah. And Jacob is upset. He's angry. The trickster has been tricked. And in this part of the story, that's where my heart goes to Leah. How must she feel? She's not been seen. She's not been valued. She's not been heard. And now she's not even gotten a wedding really, you know. And now she's being ignored. And Rachel is being picked again, again. Have you ever felt overlooked, especially overlooked when there's nothing in your control, maybe overlooked for a promotion, maybe overlooked for an invitation to a party or a wedding? How does it feel? It feels small to me. It feels small. And what really sticks the knife in here is it says, Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. Humans can't live unloved. We can't. We cannot live well. We cannot live abundant life. We cannot live happy or healthy if we don't feel that we are loved. If we don't know without a doubt that we are loved, it causes conflict as we see in this story, right? But it also causes internal conflict in us, which we don't see as much for Leah, but we know it's there. We can't live well when we feel unworthy, unwanted, and not needed. And this dysfunction of this family has now come to rest on Leah, So at this part in the story, I ask, where is God? Where is God in this part of the story? Where is God in your story? Well, Jacob, he's taking shortcuts again. He knows, as we heard last week, that God said, I will be with you wherever you go, but I will not be condoning your bad behavior. And we know that God is with Jacob then. But where is God in this specific moment? Well, I didn't give you the rest of the scripture. You can look it up later or just believe me now. Because it says, God saw Leah and he blessed her. And her womb was open and she gave birth to four sons. And each of those sons she named thanking God for his blessings. So God does see us. God sees us like God sees Leah in the corner, unwanted and unneeded and unloved, and says, I see you and I will bless you. And I think the problem for many of us, 
if we really admit it when we're feeling really bad and we're feeling really low, I think the problem is we think that God doesn't have enough blessings for everyone, that God doesn't have enough love for everyone. We think that somebody is favored more than us, especially when we start to compare my life to this life, my job to this job, my children to these children. And we feel like maybe, does God even see me? Does God even know I'm here? Well, this week I went to a conference for two days and I made a friend. And do you know how I made a friend? The second day I sat someplace different. Y'all try that at church sometime. The first time, the first day I sat with these folks and the next day I sat someplace different. And I met a new friend. He's a pastor and his name is Jay. And we were talking about this story and I was telling him how I was going to tell you all that Jacob and Leah and Rachel about the favor, right? About who was the favorite that God shows that Leah is favored in this moment. But later, Rachel will get her blessing and Jacob will get his blessings. But in this moment, it was Leah that needed to be seen and loved. And I said to Jay, I said, how do you think this is going to go over? Do you think I'm on the right path with this sermon? And he said to me, I'm an immigrant from Korea. I feel like a second citizen, he said to me. He said, people won't come up to me or my wife because they think we don't speak English. People don't come up to my children or invite them to parties at school. We don't know why. Maybe it's the English. Maybe it's the different way we take off our shoes when we enter the house. He says, but I feel like a second citizen so often. And he said, when you just told me that God saw Rachel and Jesus sees me and calls me favorite, that changed my views. He says, in God's kingdom now, I understand I'm a first citizen. I matter. And in that moment of talking to Jay, my eyes were changed as well. I'm going to admit it. And I realized in that moment that I hadn't seen him as neighbor either when I first met him. But he is. We are. We are neighbors. We are loved equally. We are favored by God and God sees us. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you are God's favorite? Do you believe and do you know that on the cross when Jesus died, he didn't just die for me. He died for you. Do you know that and do you believe that? And if you believe that, what confidence does that give you? Let me show you something I have in my office. I'm going to let Miss Clara read it for us. Miss Clara, what does this say? Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> so what did Miss Clara just say? Am I his favorite? Or is she his favorite? You see, when people come into my office, they see this plaque and they laugh and they think I'm being sarcastic because I usually am. Right? They're like, oh yeah, you're his favorite, Pastor Sarah. And I said, no, read it again. Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. When you read this, you are the eye. You are the apple of Jesus's eye. And what does that mean for you? How do you live your life differently when you know that you are loved? How do you live your life differently when you know that you matter? And how do you share your gifts when you know God has given you gifts to build this kingdom? Your story is part of Leah's story and Rachel's story. And sorry, it's kind of Jacob's story too. We all have those times when we deceive and trick. But more importantly, your story is part of Jesus' story. And there is no competition for Jesus' love. Jesus loves you. And you do not have to fight with anyone else to prove it. You don't have to put anyone else down 
to climb the ladder. So now let's look at this story again. When I got to this part of Leah, I felt really sorry for her. And then I saw the blessing that God had given her. But if you look at the bigger picture, God keeps God's promise that Jacob will be blessed. And he is. And he has many sons and becomes the ancestor with as many followers and people after him as sands on the beach or stars in the sky. Now, Laban's a trickster. I kind of don't want him to win in this, but he's blessed too. And I can tell you one thing that he's blessed by, because it took me a long time to think about, because I didn't like Laban in this story, but you know what he's got? Grandchildren. Can I get an amen? Right? He gets grandchildren. And Rachel, she gets Joseph. You'll see that later. But she also is loved by her husband. So when we look at this story and we look at the blessings, they may not be the blessings that we would want, but they were the blessings that God gave. So when you look at your life, open your eyes a little wider. What are the blessings in your life? How has God favored you? How has Jesus shown you that you are loved beyond measure? That he loves you and he died for you and he gives you gifts and wants you to share those blessings in the world. What difference does it make to you to know that you are loved? Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for how you love us and how you care for us and how you give us gifts and one another. Lord, help us to see our blessings and forgive us when we think that you don't care or you don't see us. Help us know, Lord, that we are worthy because you are Lord. Amen.